Since human speech is a very interesting signal, humans have tried for a long time to produce or to reproduce speech. That is, they have created models of speech production. And one of the first model is this mechanical model, which you see in the slide, which has been built by von Kempelen. It actually reproduces the human speech production process in three parts, namely these bellows, which correspond to the energy source, so to our lungs, and then this box, which is able to generate different types of excitation signals, either noise-like signals or even periodic signals with this reed cut off here. And then, of course, we need the vocal shaping through the vocal tract, which is done here in this open, open to the end leather resonator. This resonator actually had to be shaped by a human hand, so this is not really a speaking machine, but the intelligence of how to control it relies in the hand of this human operator. These historic machines uh, are very interesting, but nowadays one tries to model other, uh, to use other models, more precise models, uh, especially models of the vocal tract. And one of the most popular models is the so-called tube model. As you have already seen, we can describe the vocal tract as a series of tubes with different diameters or different cross area sections here. And I've put those little elements of tubes in a row so that you can more easily identify them. We can calculate the sound pressure wave which can exist inside such a series of tubes. And in order to start in a simple way, I will first consider one simple element of such a tube, that is a tube of constant cross area section here. In such a tube, um, we have a hard ending at the glottis, that's what I already explained, and we have a sonically soft ending at the mouth because the air pressure wave can go out easily. Such a tube, there are different waveforms which can exist, um, which should all show a maximum at this end of the sound pressure and a minimum of the sound pressure at this end. The first such waveform is this one, where a quarter of the wavelength corresponds to the length of the tube. The second such waveform is this one, which is shown with a dotted line, where three quarters of the wavelength just fit into the length of the tube. And so you will see more and more waveforms for which the resonance frequency is an impair multiplicative of this term. In this term we have uh, C, which is the sound velocity, and where here we have 4L. L is the length of this tube. If we take a numeric example and assume that the tube from here, from the larynx to the tip of your lips is approximately 17 centimeters long, and if we assume that the sound velocity is approximately 340 meters per second, then we come to resonance frequencies which are impair multiplicatives of 500 hertz approximately. That means that the formants which can exist in such a tube are 500 hertz, 1500 hertz, 2500 hertz, and so on. Now this is the simple case of a tube with constant cross area section. If we have variable cross section area, we have to resolve more complex equations, namely the so-called Webster equation, which is a differential equation where we have the double derivative of the sound pressure over the x-coordinate, and we have the double derivative of the sound pressure over the time t, and we also have a simple derivative of the sound pressure over x, uh, which is determined by this dA over x. A is the uh, area of your tube element. Uh, and we have the two boundary conditions, namely that the sound pressure needs to be zero at the mouth, and it needs to be maximum at the uh, glottis at x over x equal to zero, and the equivalent for the sound velocity, q, it's zero at the glottis and it's maximum at the mouth. 
If we assume one element only, then we can assume that within this element, this dA over x will be zero because the tube has a constant diameter. That means that this whole part here will vanish. And this simplifies the equation to this form which you see here. In order to resolve this equation, we can assume that the sound pressure wave consists of two parts, one running into the positive direction and one running into the negative direction. This part runs into the positive x direction, this part runs into the negative x direction, and the overall sound pressure is the sum of both parts. Same can be applied for the velocity equation here. What is important is that at the intersection of two tube of two tube elements with different diameters, the sound pressure needs to be the same and also the velocity need to be the same. That is, the sound pressure coming from here needs to go further on there and the part of the sound wave which goes into this direction needs to continue in that uh, tube section. Now, um, we can resolve this equation by introducing a so-called reflection factor which consists just of the um, relationship of the two area sections, A1 and A2, of the two tube elements. And then we can formulate an equation for the part of the sound pressure in section 2, which goes into the positive x direction, and it can be expect like, expressed like this one, and also part of the sound pressure in the first element 1, uh, which goes into the negative direction. Here you see these sound pressure constituents uh, illustrated and you also see what happens at the boundary between these two tube elements, namely that there is a part of this sound pressure which is reflected, going back. The same happens here, sound pressure which has been already reflected is re-reflected here, going back there. And then there is another part of the sound pressure which just passes this discontinuity and the same here. This structure of the tube model is called the Kelly-Lachbaum structure. And it can of course be easily realized with these delay lines, which represent the time the sound pressure wave needs to travel through a tube segment, and then this reflection configuration, which represents what happens at the intersection of two tube elements. In many cases, such an acoustic representation of tubes is not necessary and we can use a simplified model which is based on the two-step speech production process, namely the generation of an excitation signal and the shaping of this excitation signal through the vocal tract. The excitation signal can be either a periodic one with a certain fundamental frequency and we can even model the more complicated triangular-shaped glottis filter impulses here, or it can be a noise-like signal, as you see here, for unvoiced sounds. We can have either only the periodic excitation or only the non-periodic excitation, but we can also combine those two by putting different amplitude factors and such producing sounds which have a mixed periodic and non-periodic excitation, like you have, for example, in a zzz sound. This excitation signal is then pushed through the vocal tract, and the vocal tract puts the envelope maxima onto it, which correspond to the formants, which are numerated F1, F2, F3 here, and which then can be added in order to form the speech signal here. So the source filter model basically says that we can reproduce the speech production process by generating an excitation signal and shaping this excitation signal through a simplified version filter of the vocal tract. This is of course a simplified model. For example, it does not include uh, explosive excitation signals like for a B and a P. There are some ways to better model this vocal tract. One of the ways which is very uh, interesting because it's also used in the analysis of speech signal is the realization of the vocal tract through a filter which has such a transversal filter in kind of feedback loop which you see here. So here you have the excitation signal, 
Here you have the speech signal. And what happens inside this box is actually illustrated here. It's a simple combination of delay lines with different delay times and multiplicative factors here. And all these parts are just added up here. So we have a simple non-recursive filter here, which is then put into this recursive feedback loop. Such a realization of the vocal tract filter is very interesting for analyzing speech signal, as we will see with the so-called LPC analysis later on.